Welcome to Time with Teresa Around the World, bringing you up close and personal conversations with Christian leaders, authors, artists, filmmakers, talents, and celebrities from across the globe. Teresa and her guests are sure to warm your heart and encourage your soul. And now your host, Teresa Westbrook. How in the world can you forgive people who do the unforgivable? Today's guest, author, and pastor Mark Soresby will walk us through his personal story of finding healing and freedom through Christ from a nightmare of abuse and years of suffering. Welcome to the program, Pastor Mark. Welcome, Pastor Mark. Well, thank you for having me today. It's an honor to be with you and to be able to share with your guests and viewers today. So thank you so much for having me. Well, we are delighted that you're here with such an important message to share with our audience. And uh, I just want to say thank you for coming and sharing because many men find it very hard to share past childhood sexual abuse with others. And we thank you for your courage to share your story with the audience today. So let's go ahead and get started and please give us a brief walk through your childhood abuse, pain and suffering. Well, again, I'll just give you a brief overview of it. But I was born uh, from an affair. My father was not in my life. My mother and father had an affair and I was a product of that. At seven years old, my mom would marry a man that was 20 years her younger and he would come into our home and abuse me. He would abuse me in every way, shape, or form. He would, he would grow me and abuse me and, and sell me to others. He stabbed me and beat me, raped me, and there's a lot of ugliness that happened. And from 7 to 14, that was the reality that I lived in, is that abuse. That really became the atmosphere of my life. That 7 to 14, that abuse happened daily. I was beaten, broken, insulted, just every form of abuse there was. And again, that's just a moment, just a second, just kind of a quick overview of those ugly years of abuse. Well, that was a lot for a child to walk through because you mentioned physical abuse, sexual abuse, and sex trafficking. Yes. Yes, that's true. And all those things happen. And again, it was a I was seven years old, 14, trying to figure out which way was up. I was angry, confused, sad, hurt, wounded, neglected, abused. But really what I felt mostly in those years was just numb. Uh, I had just a numbness around my heart, around my spirit. I was too young to understand. It was a different time. I'm on the other side of 50. Today, there's a lot of awareness and support and advocacy. But back in those days, my mom came from a generation that if you didn't talk about it, it didn't happen. And unfortunately, we didn't talk about those things in my home. So every day I was getting abused and it was just whitewashed, if you would. And those things that really held on to me and it took a hold of me for many, many years. Yes, I can. I can just imagine because I'm, I'm also a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and, and it I'm took so the Lord to bring my restoration and healing. Amen. 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 So, well, now uh, the abuse happened at one the hands of one of your mother's boyfriends and so i was wondering well, uh did that affect your relationship with your mother oh of course yes i i think it definitely did it was really my mother's husband uh she married this man i was seven years old when they got married and uh, he started to abuse me almost immediately until i was 14 years old when the abuse stopped because of two things. First of all, I was strong enough to fight my abuser off. And I found a loved one in our family. I found my uncle. I was able to uh, confess to him everything that was going on. And he supported me with his love and with his actions. But yeah, there was a strife because I think that I, I thought then my mom was supposed to protect me. Uh, she was supposed to stand up for me. And years later, I come to understand my mom was being abused in her own right. But at that, that doesn't negate that. That doesn't negate what she I refused to do for me, but it helped me understand a little bit more why she wasn't able to protect me. So, yeah, I think uh, I had a lot of hurts, a lot of pains, a lot of rejections. And sure, yeah, there was a season where I blamed my mom, too. Yep. Yes, well, you know, many victims find it harder to forgive innocent family members that they sh thought should have known or protected them. Uh they have, find it harder to forgive them than they even do their victimizers. And um, so uh, apparently you went through this as well. 
So about how long did it take for you? Well, I know this side, we all understand this side, but during that time, kind of walk us through that during that time. Well, again, those times of forgiveness happened at my 15th year. I was about 15 years old. I was going from junior to senior year of high school, and I got invited to church. Again, that has a big, long story behind it. It's called the testimony, right? And that summer, I asked Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. And by that act of faith, by that confession, Lord came into my heart and became my Savior. And then we started the journey that I call Forgiven the Nightmare. And as I started that journey to learn how to forgive, learn how to trust, I didn't start off saying, Lord, I want to forgive my mom. I want to forgive my abuser. I started off saying, God, I want more of you. And I, you know, when you're abused, one of the, one of the casualties of abuse is trust. You don't trust anybody or anything. So the Lord had to bring me on this journey, if you would, to teach me to trust him. And as I learned to trust him, not religion, not just a church, not just a denomination, but as I learned to trust God, I started to learn to walk by faith. And the, the outcome of that, the sum of seeking God and trusting God was forgiveness. But I didn't seek forgiveness. I sought the Lord. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And so as you sought the Lord and got more and more of the Lord, he was able to help you to release forgiveness. Um, and I wonder, Pastor Mark, sure. at first, did you have some... Um, some reservations about God because of what you went through? Oh, How sure. did you even trust God and trust God after going through all of that? Well, yeah, I had my walls up. I had my uh, my guard up. I was always waiting for the other foot to drop. Something negative was going to happen. The love was going to forsake me. I, you know, It took me a while to learn to trust God. I went to church and I found solid people, but I didn't find perfect people. And in, in their kindness, they said a lot of ignorance. Uh, you know, they would say, forgive and forget, forgive and let go. You know, God told you to do this or you won't be forgiven. And I, they didn't know the depth of sorrow that I carried, but I do remember seeking God. And, and again, I didn't trust because trust was taken from me. That was the casualty of abuse. But as I started to read the word, pray, and the spirit of the Lord started to speak to my heart, not audibly and not all at once. I tell everybody a part of my story is I was the one that he left the 99 for more than once. I wanted to throw in the towel. I wanted to give up. I had good days and bad days. That's why I call my book Forgiving the Nightmare. It's truly a journey that now on this side of 50, not, not on this side of, but this side of 50, I can confess that by Christ's love and grace, I've been able to forgive those who trespass against me. Yes, and you bring out such a good point that it is a journey to healing, forgiving and healing. and and really. Um, it, it's layers, layers and layers of healing that the Lord brings to us. Amen. And Amen. it's such an important step to be able to release it. We must forgive, forgive ourselves, forgive God. If we feel like God has been involved in this in a negative way and then forgive those who hurt us. Now, forgiving doesn't mean trusting. That's does right. not mean trusting giving them another opportunity or making ourselves so vulnerable uh, because they have to be accountable. But the levels of forgiveness are amazing, Pastor Mark, and I'm sure you've okay. experienced this. There's superficial forgiving, and then That's there's right. real deep soul, soul searching forgiveness to where you come to a point. There's actually God can get you to a point where you want that person to be saved and you're able to love their soul as Christ loves souls and want them to acknowledge their wrong. That's a depth, yeah. Amen. Amen. That's a depth of forgiveness that I think I'm still on the journey for, you know, I'm still seeking God for that unconditional forgiveness. But I think, as you said, uh, that forgiveness has many, many uh, layers to it. And when I found out what forgiveness really is, it really helped me. I always really came from this perspective, forgive and forget. And that's not intellectually honest. Uh, how can I forget that my body was invaded, that my, my body was pierced with stabs and knives and burns? How can I forget that I was sold to somebody else and humiliated and just uh, uh, just somebody's lustful desire? 
So what I had to learn was what forgiveness is and isn't. And as I learned, forgiveness doesn't mean it's okay. I'm not saying, hey, I forgive you and what you did was okay. I could still seek justice. I could still seek righteousness. If the authorities need to get involved, that should happen. It doesn't mean I forgive and forget. I can still remember and still forgive. I'm not any less than a Christian. I'm not any less than a believer. I can say that what they did was wrong, and I'm not going to forget, but I'm not going to let the memories identify me. I'm going to say, you know what? I can have my boundaries. I don't have to say, let's have Thanksgiving dinner. Let's, you know, let's go to Christmas time. I can say what you did was wrong, and it needs to be per- per- prosecuted, but I don't still need to have that, uh, okay, it's okay now. And, I, and it doesn't mean it's a one-time affair. The Lord said in his prayer, give us this day our daily bread and help us forgive those who trespass against us. And I think that dailiness is the same concept in both parts of the prayer, daily bread and daily forgiveness. So when I found that out, going, hey, you know what? I don't have to hang out with my abuser. I don't have to say it's okay. I don't have to be more than more than saying, God, I've given it to you. And by giving it to God is where I learned to forgive. Like you said, uh, you know, I don't think I ever had to learn to forgive myself. And I know that concept. What I say is I had to learn to love myself. You know, the, the, the abuse stole from me my dignity, my value, my self-respect. All that I had, the abuse stole from me. It was like a, 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 a darkness that I carried with me my whole life, even years after the physical abuse ended. So I didn't really love myself. I, I thought I was dirt. I thought I was on something on somebody's bottom of their shoe. And, and Christ tells us to love ourselves, like love our neighbors like we love ourselves. And you wouldn't want me to love you because I didn't know how to love. But loving Jesus, loving the word of God, loving the spirit of God, and knowing how much God loved me gave me a confidence to love myself, not in an arrogant way, not in a narcissistic way, but in a way that's, that glorifies God. And through that concept, I was able to love others. So yeah, you're right. The depth of forgiveness is so many layers. And, and that's why I called it the journey, the process, the the, the path. The, you know, there's so many things. And it, it's not easy. I didn't go to one church service, threw a couple dollars in the plate, went to the altar, and had one prayer. This was a constant journey. And the enemy still likes to try to uh, attack me. You know, his mercies are made new every morning. What I tell people, it was the mountain casted it, the, this mountain of abuse casted its shadow on everything I did. In a lot of ways, this mountain didn't get any smaller. What happened was God got bigger. And the brightness and the glory of God got got brighter than all the lies of the enemy. So no longer is my identity victim. No longer is my identity uh, raped. No longer that. Now my identity, not in its imperfection as it is, my identity that my identity is Jesus Christ. So I hope that helps. Oh, that is so good. That is so good. That mountain didn't get smaller. Jesus got bigger. God got bigger and brighter. Yes, yes. Overcome the darkness with the light of Christ. Right. Amen. Praise God. But to get to that point, a person has to surrender to the Lord, make him Lord of their life, let him come in and bind up every wound in our right. heart and in our body and in our minds. That's oh, right. Praise God. That's you know, so I, I usually tell that story this way. When I first came to the Lord, somebody said, you know, if you have enough faith, you can move a mountain. You can tell a tree to be replanted. And I said, what's that mean? And the Lord took me into my prayer closet and he said, Mark, do you have enough faith to move a pebble? I said, yeah, I can move a pebble. He said, do you have enough faith to move a stone and a rock and a boulder and a hill and a mound? And slowly years went by and seasons and decades went by. And I learned to grow in faith and move mountains and hills. And I learned what that meant and what it didn't mean. Then one day God said, let's go move that mountain. And I knew that mountain meant to forgive my mom and to to surrender my abuser into the hands of God. And and I said, Lord, I don't want to do it. It's too hard. I, I, I'm not ready to do that. And the Lord said, how'd you move the pebble? And how'd you move the stone and the rock and the boulder and the hill, the mountain? I said, Lord, you helped me. And he said, now I'm going to help you move that mountain. And when the Lord helped me move that mountain, I became free. I didn't become free because I became weak. I became free because God became stronger. And God's strength helped me to forgive. I never said it's okay. I, I don't want to have a picnic with the person who abused me. Actually, he's passed on. My mom has passed on. Uh, but 
but I could say that God has brought me to forgiveness because of his grace and his mercy. So it's true that I grew up abused and all the ugliness and scars that, that, that came with it touched my life. But it's also true that's not my identity. My identity is Jesus Christ. And I had plenty of help along the way. I had counselors and coaches and pastors and friends. So this wasn't by myself. I had people hold up my hands and help me from one step to the next. Precept by precept, step by step. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. And praise God for your healing. Thank you, Jesus, for your Amen. healing. Well, Pastor Mark, just really think and, and share with our viewers today, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self during that terrible, terrible, awful time of despair and hopelessness and uh, confusion what would you be able to say to him today? Well, first thing I would say to anybody or my, my younger self is God loves you. Abuse steals love, hope, support. And I would say God loves you. And I was in a dark place, not even, I didn't know what love is, but God loved me even in the pit of my despair. And then the next thing I tell myself is that I'm not alone. You know, sometimes when we go through these traumas, and that's really what my book's about. My trauma was child abuse, but there's so many other nightmares and traumas. When you go through it, other people have walked through it. Other people have walked through addictions and deaths and destructions and divorces and all kinds of hurts and pains that the enemy tries to hold us down to. And the enemy likes to say, you're the only one, Mark. You're the only guy that's been abused. You're the only girl that's gone through this. You're the only one. So we keep it inside. But God has given us so many people that's walked before us. And they're there to help us. There's advocacy, there's support, there's prayer, there's hope. So don't believe the lie of the only one and believe the truth that God loves you today. Yes, amen. That's so good. And we want our viewers and listeners to understand that child abuse is a crime. That's right. People should be held accountable. That's right. But many times it happens within families. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it's much, much more complicated, That's right. much more difficult to do these things. But we're very much aware of that. But we're also aware of the power of God Amen. to Amen. heal and to forgive and not only to heal a victim, but also to heal and save a victimizer. You know, everyone will get on board with the justice wagon, you know, but they can't reach that depth to that victimizer has a soul. And you can only do that through Christ because so much of my love was destroyed and dead and I couldn't resurrect it. But the love of Christ never died. So I still had love for that soul and prayed for that soul who victimized me and prayed that they would make heaven even though the natural love, the surface love, it was dead and gone, and I just could not resurrect it at all. But we want our viewers and listeners to understand this, praise God. And uh, also to the parents, the unoffending parents, don't blame yourself if your child has been victimized. No one goes around thinking that someone, especially in their family, is going to victimize their child. You know, you can't be there every moment. And these victimizers are led by an evil spirit that's very cunning, very cunning and very crafty. And it can happen in a matter of moments without you knowing it. So uh, would you speak to those parents, maybe have a word of encouragement for them, Pastor? Well, I know that, you know, abuse destroys. That's, it's a lie from the enemy, regardless of what kind of abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, no matter if you're a, a child or an adult, uh, abuse destroys. And then the family's left with guilt, shame, anger. I should have, I could have, I would have. Why did I? Why did? So those questions are difficult ones. And they're ones that we wrestle with ourselves and we wrestle with God. But if you have a victim in your family, uh, a part of confessing is you're like, you don't want to interrupt the family. You, you don't want to feel like you're, you're, uh, you've done something against the family. And now you've been brainwashed. You've been groomed as a child to think if you tell, everybody's going to get mad at you. And then the anger comes out because it's a place to be righteously angry about. And usually the victim goes, oh, look, it's my fault. So I think it has to be submerged in love and honesty. Like you said, there's a, there's a place for justice. But parents, 
I know you want to lift up your fists. I know you, and, and you should. There's a place for you to do that. But the, you've got to wrap your arms around those victims, no matter when you are the victim, and let God's love permeate that. Because we're talking about souls, and souls can walk around with damages. But when God heals them, he sets them free for his glory. So, yeah, I understand. I, you know, I have children, and I praise God that they've had a healthy and safe life. But if I was put in that position, boy, it'd only be God that can help me walk through that. Anyway. Yes, amen. Amen. And we just never know who's going to be hearing these programs. So if you are a victimizer or you have that in your past, you need to go with to the Lord with it. Then you need to go and apologize and make it right to your victim, if at all possible. And you need to seek the Lord and counseling because there is hope for you. Even there is hope for you too to be restored, to be healed, because we know the enemy is at work in everyone's life in different ways. Well, I'm just thanking the Lord uh, for how God has helped you, Pastor Mark, turn your story of tragedy into a message of triumph. Amen. As Amen. many people need hope to overcome such cruel devastations in life. And, and what a blessing your book, Forgiving the Nightmare, must be to others. So take a few minutes and tell us more about the book and how it's helping people everywhere. Well, thank you for that. Again, my book is just a, a response to obedience. God told me to write the book. I'm a dyslexic. I graduated high school with a third grade reading level. I was a special ed kid. And God said, write a book. And I, any good Christian, I said, no, I can't do it. But God got the last laugh. And we wrote this book. And we put it out there. I tried to make it as honest and as true and as Christ-centered as I know how. And I've prayed over it. I am not sensational. I don't say, hey, it's a prayer and it goes away. I talk about the journey of struggle, doubt, and victory in Jesus Christ. And if it could be a testimony to bless others, I hope people will get a hold of it today. And I've put a little bit in the back called my trail markers that kind of help me on my journey to make sure I'm still looking at my blind sides to say, Lord, am I still where I should be? And you can find my book on Amazon. Go to Amazon and you can go there, Amazon, look up Forgiving the Nightmare. And also go to our website, forgivingthenightmare.com, forgivingthenightmare.com. Uh, do you have a story you can share where someone's read the book and reached out to you? I can. You know, I've been I've been a, on a handful of podcasts and radio interviews, and I got an email not long ago from somebody in California. That's clearly across the United States from where I live in Massachusetts. And they were writing me, and I could tell they were a married couple. And she wrote and said, you know, I was get, we were getting ready to go out for the evening. My husband was waiting for me to get dressed. And a podcast you were on, we could hear your testimony. And I was doing my hair, and I was doing my makeup, and my husband was listening, and I were listening. And I turned around, and I saw my husband crying. He said, tears coming down this man's face. We have grown children. We have grandchildren. We've had a 20-plus year marriage. And closer to 30 years. And I looked at him and he looked at me for the first time and he said, Mark's story is my story. And she wrapped her arms around her husband and they prayed and now they're seeking help and counseling. And she said that was the first time that he confessed to her after 30 years, the father of her children, you know, a, a happy marriage. A, yeah, but it was the first time he confessed it. And when he confessed it, she told me in the email that, you know, it kind of did ring off. Oh, that's why he relaxed like that. And that's why he acted like that. And that's why. And now they could, they were seeking God. They were praying together and going for help. And that's just one of many emails that I've heard that God has given victory. And that's what it's about. It's about a journey, about trusting God and knowing that you don't have to live in this place of sorrow and pain. Your abuse doesn't have to be your identity. You could be a new creation in God. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. That is wonderful. Praise God. And I just pray that this program will reach out and touch many, many people, no matter where they're at, which side of the fence they're on, and no matter where they're at in the journey, and will bring the healing and the hope that they need. Praise God. Well, now you've also established a ministry called Forgiving the Nightmare as well. Tell us more about that. Sure. Yeah. We Out of the book came a ministry. We've been able to speak out uh, at different conferences and different churches. We have uh, been at a couple of classes. We've done some classes. And it's just bringing the journey of forgiveness. Again, trusting God in those difficult times. Because when you're walking through this journey, there are mountaintops and valleys. 
There's a cross sometimes you have to die on. And that old man wants to run away. And it's that journey that we're on to tell people good that this doesn't have to be who you are, but Christ has made you new. Jacob wrestled with an angel until he got a new name. And that new name became Israel. And the angel said to him, because you've wrestled with God and man, you've become an overcomer. In a lot of ways that as you're wrestling through your past, God can make you an overcomer. You don't have to be a victim. You don't have to be abused, but you can be somebody new. You can be the overcomer with wrestling, with self, with past, and holding on to Jesus. Yes, wonderful. Well, do you have a wonderful story and testimony how someone's been helped by your ministry? Well, again, I shared with you that email. That's great. But yeah, I think that uh, a lot of times I speak at men's ministry. And uh, I remember being at one's men's group and I had an altar call and nobody came. And I thought, boy, Lord, I, I've opened up the altar a million times. But after the service, men came to me. And I remember this one man and he buried it for years. And it he was living his life always being afraid that the past was going to come back. And again, he was an older man. And it was the first time that he came to me and talked about, he said, I could never forgive the person who, who abused me. And I didn't start talking about that. I talked about loving God. But can you love God? I didn't ask you about forgiveness. I didn't ask you about letting go. I didn't ask you to say it's okay. I asked you, can you love God? That's it. And in that journey of loving God, he would let me know sometimes later that he was giving the situation to God. So that's where I kind of start. I don't think, now God could do it in the twinkling of an eye. My miracle didn't come that way. You know, David had to walk through the valley. And I think that sometimes when you're talking about the deep abuses of somebody's soul, spirit, flesh, and mind, sometimes a journey, a valley that we have to walk through. I believe God could do it in a second. But if he doesn't do it in the twinkling of an eye, my miracle is in any less because it took a season. It's still a beautiful miracle. So I'm hearing this man, and he's on his season. He's walking through that valley. He's, you know, a lot of people ask me, how did you know that, that you were overcoming? And I say, I give a word picture here. See, the word picture is that everything in my life I was handed on, I was holding on to with white knuckles. You know, everything I did was white knuckles. I was always waiting for something bad to happen. Somebody to neglect me. Somebody to reject me. Somebody to come up and say, I knew it. You're not good. Because that's what I believed about myself. And as I let God's word become bigger than my abuses word, as I let God's love become greater than the hate that I had for myself, as I let the truth of the Lord touch me more than the pain of the sorrow of the abuse. And I don't say that lightly. I know how big that is. I started to realize I wasn't holding on to the things of life as tightly. And there was a peace that was coming over me. I wasn't always looking in my blind sides. I wasn't always worried about the next day. I was secure, not because what I've done. I was secure because what Jesus has done. And I think that's what forgiveness has done for me. I've given it to Christ. I, I've prayed, God, you have your way on all those that have passed before me because you are a God of love and justice. But I say, God, help me not walk in the brokenness of the abuse, but may I not let the abuse be who I am. May I be a servant of God. So the ministry, forgive the nightmare, that's what we talk about. And we see people admitting it for the first time. They've buried it so long. But you know, hurt's going to come out. Hurt's going to come out. No matter how, you know, it may not be, you may not talk about, oh, I was abused, but it's going to come out. It may come out by eating too many donuts. It may come out by drinking too much alcohol, or but a hurt always comes out. And God wants to not let us live in that hurt, but he wants to set us free. So no matter what your trauma is, I have friends that have lost children. I can't even fathom what that would be like to lose a child. I've had friends that were addicted to alcohol and, and, and drugs. I've had friends that have gone through horrible bankruptcies and ugly divorces and, and betrayals and all those things. But God doesn't want that to be their identity. He wants to be their identity. Absolutely. Praise God. Praise God. Well, I tell you, this 30-minute show cannot do justice to all we need to share. So I invite the uh, viewers to go to your website and look up more and get a hold of the book. And 
Uh, Pastor Mark, thank you so thank much you. for thank coming you. and sharing your touching story. I know it's going to be a blessing to many hurting people around the world, and we thank you for your service. Well, thank you, and God bless you. It was an honor to be with you and your listeners today. Thanks for joining us. To find out more about Teresa and where the Time with Teresa Around the World TV and radio podcasts are streaming, visit TeresaWestbrook.com. For prayer, guests, and sponsorship opportunities, contact Teresa today. We look forward to hearing from you.